yeah welcome to india's first and largest conference on uh, metabolic health as well as low carb nutrition uh, this is turning out to be a mega event and we are very excited to have you so thank you so much for joining us uh, you know it must be a good morning there uh, so i'm going to introduce you for you know the benefit of those uh, who may not know about you uh, but a lot of us have been following your work and we are big fans so Uh, let me quickly launch into the introduction and then then we'll kick it off so hi everyone uh, dr brian lenske is here he is based in san diego us uh, is an internal medicine doctor and specifically focused on clinical nutrition uh, he runs an independent practice which is called as low carb md in san diego california uh, he has been voted as one of the top doctors of san diego for several years and he specifically uses the power of nutrition and lifestyle modifications to help patients attack root causes of chronic diseases and uh, i re- what i really love about him is that you know he always values the patient's freedom of choice he always speaks about that uh, online and wants all of us to be better informed uh, you know he's a panel expert on diet doctor uh, and he is using podcast to create public awareness on a wide range of issues Uh, health fitness and more and uh, i should mention both those podcasts here one is the low carb md podcast uh, which he co-hosts with uh, dr tro and the other one is life's best medicine right uh, and by the way he leads by example he dropped more than 50 pounds himself following the right nutrition and lifestyle changes right so i'm very stoked to ha- you know have you here uh, dr lenskes and welcome and let's get into the discussion No, Mandar, thank you so much. It's such an honor. I, I love, I've been a fan of all the work that you all are doing, and what an amazing lineup! I, I was teasing you before we came on that someone must have called in sick for me to get in because you have the top of the top here, and it's just amazing to see that you could pull it together. It's hard to get all these these big names like Professor Noakes and Ken Berry and you know Sean Baker. It's just such an honor to to speak after them. Thank you, thank you. All powered by you know D Life's Anoop Singh and Shashi, as you know. so uh, you know i'm i'm a team member just helping them out so uh, so what i want to kick it off with is you know you have had your personal transition changing your own lifestyle habits adopting the low carb way so maybe why don't we start there and also you know what specifically the benefits that you saw yeah i was in standard medicine you know for 15 years or so before i had any inkling of looking at these things and you know just as a background for me in 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 high school you know I was overweight as a kid you know f- food was the center of our universe in my family and people drank and you know smoked and didn't really take care of themselves on my mom's side all my uncles died in their 40s and 50s of cardiac disease diabetes complications all these disasters and I was like uh, I don't think I want to end up like these guys so in high school I played football and I'm not that tall so I had to gain weight to play football with these big guys and then i had to lose weight for wrestling season and i was wrestling you know 40 pounds difference between the two seasons so uh you know it just it's terrible for your metabolic rate and and everything else to starve yourself and to run and you know to work out really like biggest loser type stuff and then as i got older to to college we, we would take study breaks and eat pizza then we eat, you know take a study break and we associated that eating with peace and so i started gaining weight and i was practicing you know for 15 years at this point and i was slowly gaining weight every year even though i was i was exercising you know five or six days a week generally i've never been lazy sitting around bouts thinking how can i be gaining weight and my sugars were in the pre diabetic range of uh, uh following the american diabetes association diet you know and exercising and i know i'm not cheating so i know it's oh obviously sometimes cheating but for the most part i was sticking to that and you know i i believed all those things and then what happened is i had a patient who came in that lost 40 pounds and i said what I, it worried me at first i said what happened what what are you doing he said you're not going to like it i'm doing something called the fast diet i said well what's that and he said well i uh on tuesdays and thursdays i basically fast i eat only meat and vegetables no no carbohydrates that those days and i said okay and it was like 500 calories on those days or less and i said well if you're eating 500 calories on tuesday then wednesday you must eat twice as much and and then i asked him what about the other days besides those two fasting days a week what do you what do you do and he said why well, eat whatever i want i said well pizza and soda he goes yeah i said well that can't be right and i said so if you don't eat on tuesday you must be starving on wednesday and eat twice as much and he said no i'm not hungry those days it's so weird 
And then I stopped drinking soda and I stopped eating this. And I st- so he started feeling better. I thought, that's weird. So I started researching and I come across Jason Fung, of course, and he's talking about insulin resistance and, and fasting and how we could rest the pancreas a little bit and we can get metabolically healthier. And then, you know, I started looking into it more and more. Then I come across Professor Noakes and Gary Fetkin. I'm like, oh, these guys are going through trials because they're telling people not to eat sugary cereal for breakfast. And I thought, this is crazy. How can that possibly be? And then within uh, six months, I had 11 of my patients come off insulin because they were asking me what I was doing. And I said, well, I can't officially tell you, but it's not the standard of care, but this is what I'm doing. I'm just telling you, I'm, I'm doing intermittent fasting, cutting my carbohydrates out and eating real food. And uh, so then I started seeing the differences in myself and patients. So I started going down the the rabbit hole and I went to a conference, um, uh, Low Carb USA, and it was like 10 minutes from my office. So I thought, I'll just mm-hmm. go see what these crazy people are talking about. And then I started seeing oncologists and nephrol and kidney doctors and cancer doctors and heart doctors. And, and I thought, wow, this is not just like some hocus pocus few doctors talking about this. There's more doctors uh, out there doing this kind of medicine. Very interesting that you mentioned actually so many types of doctors and so many types of diseases, right? So I want to ask you, uh, somebody may have said to you, you know, insulin is just one hormone, right? But how do you explain to them the core role of insulin as well as insulin resistance and how it touches, you know, so many of these diseases? Well, you know, I use different analogies to explain it. You know, Jason Fung uses a suitcase analogy. And so basically... Getting down to, like, especially in the Indian and Asian population, uh, it, if you think about it as storage units, you know, a place to store your, your if you're buying stuff at the grocery store and you, you need storage units to store your everything you're buying, uh, some people don't have very many storage units. So if you can't put things in the storage units, which are, are your fat cells, really, then sooner or later what happens is you need to have a bunch of people to help you shove more things into that storage unit. And that's insulin. So when the insulin starts going up, we know the storage units are full and that's a problem. So when people are watching their diet and exercising and not eating as much sugar, then the storage units are half empty. So if someone has a lot of mu- like Sean Baker is an example, or Ken Berry, they have so much muscle mass that if they want to eat extra carbohydrates, it goes to their muscles. Well, a lot of people in the Indian and Asian communities don't have a lot of muscle mass. So then they run out of storage. So they can weigh 130, 140 pounds and still get type two diabetes. And this is something so unusual to us. You know, when I first, one of my first patients that I I started thinking about this weighed 150 pounds and he got type two diabetes and he was very active. So I thought, how can he possibly have diabetes? He doesn't weigh 400 pounds, like what we normally see, but he ran out of storage units earlier and he was hiking across the Grand Canyon and he was very active, but all day long, he all he ate was carbohydrates because he didn't care because he wasn't gaining weight. But then all of a sudden, he got full blown diabetes, and so we had to look at his diet. And once we changed his diet and took out the, he was drinking sodas all day, and and because he thought he needed the sugar for energy to go across on these big hikes. And once we stopped that, everything normalized within a you know within a month or so. And I've seen that w- with some of my uh, people of Indian descent and Asian descent when they start cutting carbohydrates and doing a little bit of weight bearing exercise. It's amazing how their metabolic uh, health changes dramatically. And so really one of the biggest thing I look at, and honestly, for the first 15 years of my practice, I never checked an insulin level because I didn't understand why we would do that. But you know, now I, now you understand that we have at least 10 or 15 years before someone gets the diagnosis of diabetes, that insulin goes up and up and up. And the body just stops listening to insulin and says, look, my storage units are full. I cannot put anything else in here. Stop buying things. Stop eating sugar, right? And so if we stop eating sugar, then we empty out our storage units and then we we can put that sugar in there easily. Hopefully that makes sense too. Yeah, definitely. I think it's an interesting analogy. And what you mentioned about the lean diabetics, right? Uh, or, or people who visually look lean, but they are metabolically unhealthy. I think that is an important point for all of us Indians uh, because we may assume that, you know, hey, I'm healthy, or I'm quote unquote fit, right? Because I'm doing some physical activity. So I think this separation of uh, what you're able to do from a fitness point of view uh, versus your metabolic health and then tracking insulin, I think that is spot on. Uh, Amazing advice there for uh, patients as well as physicians. So uh, one more thing I keep noticing is that, you know, a lot of times we are told to uh, just discuss the symptoms is what we mainly discuss, right? Just suppress those symptoms, take a pill for something. And I noticed that in your approach or what you talk online also, uh, you really try to go to that root cause and you know educate patients on that. Uh, so, 
what are the different kinds of conditions that you have been able to handle because of this approach of you know attacking the root cause yeah you know and and honestly my root cause has changed over time because you know a lot of the stuff we're treating is the symptom, right? So uh, Dr. Unwin and his team showed that if we got uh, people's insulin normalized, then salt wasn't raising their blood pressure anymore because insulin acts on the kidneys to make you hold on to salt. So when someone cuts out the sugar, right, and exercises more, their insulin levels come down. As the insulin level comes down, they can urinate out more salt in their urine. So their blood pressure gets better. So that's one thing we track is blood pressure. Uh, you know, we, we can get low blood pressures by dropping, you know, people are on a bunch of medicines to bring their blood pressure down because of the effects of insulin. So insulin doesn't just work on the sugar system. It also works on the kidneys. And so, and it plays a role in a lot of body function. So yes, you know, the, the surprising things that we took heat for early on, Tro and I were both noticing in our practices that when people went low carb or on a ketogenic diet or a carnivore diet, their mood got better. Or they would say, yeah, I don't crave alcohol as much. And you think about it, there are studies showing that inflammation in the brain and chronically inflamed people are more depressed and anxious. Poorly controlled diabetes is one of the biggest risk factors for depression. And people don't realize that. And, and sometimes you don't know the chicken or the egg. But what we've done is there are studies that have shown that diabetics get poor sugar control first, and then they get depressed. It's not because they're depressed and they don't care about their sugars anymore. And then once they get depressed, they really don't care and everything goes out of whack. So, you know, cancers we're, we're looking at, you know, if we, if we get the uh, metabolic health, uh, Chris Palmer from Harvard, you know, when I first heard about him, I thought he was crazy talking about, you know, treating schizophrenia and bipolar disorder with dietary changes. But now we're seeing it in the mainstream and we're seeing publications. So a lot of it we were observing. The, the problem is when we observe something, it takes about, you know, a hundred years for that to go into practice, you know, 50 to a hundred years. So it, it's definitely a challenge that, that we're facing, but there's so many underlying conditions that people with joint pains, their inflammation, you know, Sean Baker is an orthopedic surgeon and you see people's, you know, I've had people that were scheduled for a total knee replacement, go low carb or keto and their knee pain goes away and they cancel the surgery and their sugars normalized and they feel great. And so it's kind of like the joke in the United States is like, you know, the country Western songs, people talk about losing their house and family and everything gets terrible. So it's like, we're playing that song backwards. People start out really bad and they get better and better and better. And when we first talked about it, at, you know, even low carb MD episode number 10, and 13, we talked about addiction. Uh, we got attacked by doctors all over the world saying that we were crazy and we should have our license revoked for even thinking that diet had anything to do with mood. Now the data is clearly on our side. We knew what we were saying clinically, but it takes time for the science to catch up. It's an amazing benefit, right? So it's not just the what we consider as mind and body separation, but your diet is having an impact on, on both sides. Uh, Not only that, it, it goes both ways, right, Mandar? Mm -hmm. it, it's a, it, if people are stressed and they're stress eaters, they eat more. They mm -hmm. eat more sugar and they get more stressed and then they eat more to try to calm their nerves. And there's definitely studies showing that initially when insulin goes up, it makes you feel good. So if you eat candy, you feel better for a little while. But what happens is over time, just like with alcohol and other drugs, is you need more and more to get that effect. So eating one cookie doesn't do it for them. Now they need 10 cookies. Now they're going to eat the whole tray of cookies. Now they're going to gain more weight and then they get depressed and anxious. And so food becomes their friend. And, and you know, some of the studies with bariatric surgery with gastric bypass is, as a matter of fact, this week I had a conversation with, with someone and he says, oh my goodness, my sister had a gastric bypass. After that, she cheated on her husband. She started smoking. She started drinking and all this because she couldn't eat cookies, which were her drug of choice anymore. So, you know, uh, uh, a lot of people have been talking about the, the bariatric surgeons have noticed even after surgery and people are losing weight, but depression goes up, drug use, smoking, everything else, every addiction gets worse because they still have that problem in their brain. But if we can fix that with a low carbohydrate diet, then they feel better. So they don't need a cookie. They don't need all these things. You know, if you go get a massage or you're doing something you really enjoy, you don't say, okay, let's stop what I'm doing and, and go eat something, you know, but if you're depressed and anxious, you want to go grab a cookie. And that's, for a lot of people, that's a, a root cause of what we're seeing is that their underlying is they're not happy with life. They're stressed. They're tense. They're not sleeping. And all of a sudden food becomes their comfort as, as it did for many of us. Definitely. Do you, uh, so just so, just so that we all have a context of when you're saying the BP will come down and normalize and some of the other symptoms are improving, uh, what sort of a time period are we talking of? It's variable. It really is. I've had some people, they have to really work hard because the insulin is so high 
that it takes a while for it to come down. The good news is we can make an impact very quickly. I have people, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes we'll check in insulin two weeks apart and we'll see that it drops in half. So if we're going from 37 down to 16, I feel a lot better about that because their pancreas is resting and, and they're not going to burn out their pancreas because sooner or later you can't keep up making insulin and then you get a diabetes. So, uh, yeah, it's variable, but we're showing about 90% of people when they get their insulin under control, their blood pressure gets better, you know, and there's other factors involved, obviously like stress and not sleeping and, you know, trying to get that whole, as a matter of fact, my company, my, my, my clinic here is I have, um, Arizona metabolic health and San Diego metabolic health, because I realized early on just changing to a ketogenic diet or a low carb diet doesn't fix a lot of the problems because if you're on a perfect diet, but you're not sleeping and you're stressed and you're tense and worried, you know, and drinking at night and smoking and, and, you know, all those other things, factors, you're not going to have the results as much as we have to focus on the whole metabolic picture, you know, and, and, and just a, as a quick aside, Ben Bickman, who, who is a, a researcher at BYU, who's a good friend of mine now, uh, you know, I met him at a clinic and, you know, at that time I was working 18 hour days in a, in a standard medical clinic, busy all the time, staying up late, working on my charts, getting up at four in the morning, going to work, getting home at eight at night every day. So 18 hour days, most of the, most days. And, uh, I was at a conference, I ran to Ben Bickman and I say, hey, Ben, look, you're the, you're the expert on metabolic rate and, and all these things. If I want to live a long life, what do I have to do? And he said, oh, Brian, that's easy. Five things. I go, what are those five things? He said, number one, don't work 18 hour days and be stressed and running around crazy. I'm like, oh, okay, what's number two? Get enough sleep. You need seven or eight hours. If you don't get those, you're, and I was like, I don't think I like your rules, professor, because I'm O for two. And he said, that's why doctors die before everyone else. Doctors die younger than most people, right? Because we're stressed and tense and we don't take care of ourselves. So next he said, eat real food, cut out the processed food. Next he said, don't smoke or drink to excess, right? And then he said, exercise regularly, like what we're doing right now. And you say, okay, if I could do those things, the rest is not really in my control. There are some genetic factors, of course, but a lot of it is, okay, what of those five things can I work on? Some people are doing great on the diet, but they're doing terrible on the other four. So if they work on their sleep or their stress or their exercise, you know, some people are exercising a lot, but they're eating all sugar and candy at night. So it's really putting all those five things together, as many of those as we can. Sometimes it's out of our control. If we have a stressful job and we have to work long hours sometimes, okay, how do I compensate for that with the rest of those other four? Very interesting. So people are going to need uh, quite a bit of handholding when you do this with them, right? So so what's your approach of you know coaching them and taking them through this journey? Because I imagine that they're not going to be able to flip this switch very quickly. They will need a lot of guidance. Yeah. You know, some people really flip the the switch quickly. And, you know, as we talk about root cause, what I found, and, and this is, this is borne out throughout, uh, you know, recent years in medicine, there, there was a study called the ACE questionnaire, adverse childhood events. And these events, when you look at them, you know, basically it says, were you on a, a poor family, an unstable family? Was someone drinking in your family? Did someone say you're, you're the worst kid ever? Your brother's smarter than you? Like all these things, uh, suicide, sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, you know, poverty. And when they, or one family member in prison, you know, when, when they add these up out of these 10 questions, if you score seven out of 10 on this, your life expectancy is 20 years shorter than everyone else, right? You're more likely to be obese and diabetic. And then you turn to food for your comfort because you didn't have comfort from your parents. So there's a lot of things that we, in medicine, especially in the U S that we've neglected that we kind of, uh, don't realize the impact. So walking around stressed all the time, your body thinks something's going to go wrong. And if you're stressed and tense and you don't take time to meditate or pray or play with your kids or go out with your dog, whatever it is, if you don't take that time, your body thinks something bad's going to happen. So if your body thinks something bad is coming, it makes you store more fat. Because it's saying, okay, if you're not going to be able to eat for a month, if the economy is going to drop, then I want to make sure we get, you know, that you have enough nutrition. So even some people and there's a study that I was amazed by when I saw this is if you cut your calories to a thousand calories a day, which is a starvation diet, um, and you're sleeping four hours, a majority of your weight loss is muscle mass. But if that mm-hmm. same person sleeps eight hours, a majority is fat mass. So wow. why? It's because if you're, if you're a terrible hunter, your body says you're a terrible hunter and you're up all night trying to hunt and you can't kill anything, then I'm going to get rid of your muscles so you don't get burn all your fat away and die. Well, most of us are trying to burn our fat away right? So we have to get better at burning that fat. How do we do that? We put on more muscle mass and we decrease our fat mass. So hopefully that answers your question. Are are, Uh, are there any? Right, right. So 
and clearly it takes some effort and involvement from your side oh. of handholding yeah a lot of those things like you know that that's why I like what I'm doing now I'll have an hour with the patient or a half an hour at mm. least and we can sit down and say how's the marriage how's things at home how are your kids and you can get a sense of how people are doing outside of just the dietary stuff we also use continuous glucose monitors so I can see people's sugars 24 seven. So I can look back and, you know, we're working together and we'll say, well, what happened on Wednesday? And most of my patients are very good at putting down. I ate cookies on Wednesday afternoon, or I did. And so we can look at that and the patient knows themselves. So having a continuous glucose monitor, I don't know how, how much access you have there in India, but for us, it's not too hard to get that in the U S I know in, in Europe, it's hard to get, but when people see that, they say, Oh, they told me sourdough bread was fine or rice was fine. And when they eat rice and they see what their sugars do or non-bread, you know, if you're eating a lot of that or, or mango juice or whatever it is, uh, we'll see those sugars go crazy high. And then we say, oh, it's because your storage units are full and you don't have anywhere to put it. So people understand this concept. So sometimes we're just doing being social. And, and I think what you're doing here is so great because what I do every two weeks with all of my patients is we have a Zoom meeting just like this. And we could all talk, say, who's struggling? Who's doing great? What's, you know, what, is it, who's struggling with what? And they all help each other. So they sit back and watch my patients say, oh, I used to eat cookies every night too. Here's what I did. I started going for walks with my wife or, you know, I stopped drinking alcohol or whatever it is. And everyone is supportive and helpful. And some people will come in and say, I had a horrible week. I was stressed out because my mom was sick and I just turned to food. And everyone said, oh, you know, I've done that. Before. And so you're not the, when you think you're the only one, uh, it, it's mm -hmm. a problem. And that's why what you're doing is so important to let people know, okay, there's not just two doctors doing this kind of medicine. There's thousands and thousands of doctors around the world getting great results, you know? And so, so having that community is really key. And, you know, I'm so fortunate in wh where I am is that I can say, Hey, in two weeks, we're going to go for a hike. And who wants to go for a walk? And, you know, the people who are really athletic can go in front and then the slower people can, and then we meet halfway and everyone talks and shares stories. And, you know, they could ask me bio, you know, questions about biology or whatever they have questions about, but really, it's really important to have that human connection. I think that's something medicine, at least in the United States has absolutely lost. You know, people see a different doctor every time they go there at the clinic and no one knows them and what their struggles are. So really seeing the person as an individual, because reality is, there's not a one size fits all. That's something I learned. Some people can eat more carbohydrates than others. And other people, if they're diabetic, you really got to be strict on the carbohydrates and exercise and really just trying to make our bodies healthier. Um, so, you know, just, just trying to get, if you make it too difficult, people say, forget it. I'm like, I can't do that. But if you say, well, if you're drinking three Cokes a day, can you go down to one to start at, you know, whatever we meet the person where they're at, and so I have a team that is is knowledgeable on on supplements and you know different things, different tricks that may help us to improve metabolic health faster. Yeah, I think your patients are lucky to have you as well as the team because you know that that human connection, as you said, and also your approach of treating the patient and not just the symptom, you know, with a quick pill and sending them their way, and truly trying to spend that time and involving various aspects of their life in their treatment. I think that's simply amazing. So thanks for elaborating on that. Uh, so when you, so do you typically start with these patients by first telling them this logic or the underlying biology or how do you, you know, warm them up for this approach? Well, fortunately, you know, the blessing to me is that a lot of my patients select me because they hear what I'm saying and they say, well, you know what, I'm ready. I want to get healthier. What do I have to do? So a lot of doctors don't even talk about nutrition because over the years they've given bad advice, right? They said, eat six meals a day, eat sugar all day long. So your sugars are balanced. Like, wait a minute. Like when you're on insulin, we're dosing your insulin dosage on how much carbohydrates you're eating, right? So if you don't eat any carbohydrates, you're not going to need that insulin for a type two diabetic. So that's where, you know, you start realizing, oh my goodness, there's a lot of misinformation out there and, and it's hard to overcome. And that's why when I was watching Gary Fetke, by telling people not to eat cereal for breakfast, to eat eggs instead, and you see their sugars normalize, people are, are smart, right? So once they can see their sugars, once they can see it getting better, it's not my opinion. It's what happens physiologically true, when you're true. doing that, right? So when people exercise or they put on muscle mass, they're going to see their sugars improve. And they feel really good about that. They go, okay, I can, I have something. And when you see your insulin coming down, your triglycerides, your HDL coming up, going the right way, uh, you feel a lot better, you know, and your A1C is coming down. And so it's just such an honor to practice this kind of medicine because 
surprisingly, I will see, you know, these things surprise me all the time. And I'll call experts and go, Ben Bickman. Like the first time I saw someone, one of my patients, we got her diabetes under control and she was scheduled for a total knee replacement, but I couldn't clear her for surgery because her sugars were so high. And so I said, look, we got to work on either put you on insulin, which I don't agree with, but it will get your sugars low enough if you're not going to change your lifestyle because she was eating hor horrible foods every day. Like she's Latina. So they were eating tortillas and and, and desserts every day, three times a day. I, I mean, <laughs> rice all the time, soda. We got her off that. And within six weeks, she had lost 35 pounds. Her sugars normalized. We took her off three blood pressure medicines. And I said, okay, you know what? We made a deal. I'll clear you for surgery. You're, you're at a good sugar level. And she said, wait a minute. I said, what? She said, I don't need surgery. I said, what do you mean? She stands up to squats in my office up and down. And she says, I'm, I'm running up and down the bleachers every day at the high school. I was like, you got to be kidding me. You were crying six weeks ago and you couldn't move. And so she canceled her surgery. She's doing great ever since. So, you know, it's those things when you realize that we can really impact uh, a lot of different conditions, not just getting the sugars under control. And one of the biggest surprises that I saw was the improvement in mood and anxiety and stress. So if people are smiling and laughing more and having more fun in their relationship, then they're going to live longer. That That is definitely a contributing factor to all of what we're talking about. It is so multifactorial, right? And it, it must be amazing to see, you know, that thing click in their minds. And then, you know, when, as you said, they don't then take it as your opinion or, you know, just some one doctor's advice. But, you know, I think they really experience and uh, it's just super to hear. So, uh, but do you still get, you know, some uh, questions or pushback? So, I, I mean, I'll just ask one or two that I keep sort of hearing in, in these circles, right? So, for example, low carb will mean, you know, hey, you know, I'm going to have to eat a significant amount of fat, but isn't that bad for me? A, won't that make me fat or B, won't that worsen my risks of uh, heart disease? So, how do you address uh, some of those questions? Well, I think the important thing, I have several slides that I show people. It's like, okay, here's the numbers decide for yourself and what they should. There was one from the country of Colombia and they took everyone who came in the hospital with a heart attack and they said, what could we have predicted this heart attack coming? So they took the people who had heart attacks and compared them to the people who didn't have heart attacks for a year. And what they showed was that LDL cholesterol made no difference. It, it, that risk ratio was one, meaning if you had high cholesterol, you couldn't look at that alone and say, is this person mm -hmm. at risk for heart attack? Then they looked at total cholesterol there was no correlation. Then they looked at high blood pressure, doubled the risk of a heart attack. Why? Mm -hmm. Like we talked about already, high blood pressures uh, associated with high insulin levels. So if you look at a high insulin level, it was almost a 700% increased risk of heart attack. And no one looks at that. Why? Because we have a statin drug that we could throw at people when say your LDL is high, here's a statin drug. Keep doing what you're doing and we'll put you on a drug and you can live your life. Well, you got to make some dietary changes. There's a reason your LDL cholesterol is high and your triglycerides are high, right? So if we, with insulin, we don't have a drug we can put on other than metformin. Uh, uh, but the thing is, nobody's checking it. So with the cardiologist, I show my slides and, and one of the biggest risk factors for heart disease is low HDL, the good cholesterol. Mm -hmm. So if that's low, you know, there's a problem. And if your triglycerides are high, we know that's a problem. So focusing on just LDL, we have, you know, there's studies going on now where, where for instance, if I have a patient who fasts for three days, their LDL cholesterol will go the highest it's ever been. Mm -hmm. And Dave Feldman has shown that. And I've done that with my patients when I see their LDL go crazy. I'm like, well, how long were you fasting? Oh, I fast for two days before my lapse. Okay, let's just eat normal for a couple of days and see what happens. Because this energy model, I'm pretty convinced of that with Dave Feldman. I have not seen an exception in my practice yet where uh, if someone's very lean, for instance, uh, uh, women with anorexia who, who starve themselves or eat very low calories, uh, mm -hmm. their LDL cholesterol is 1200 a lot of times it's incredibly high but when they start eating again it totally normalizes right because now the body's not panicking trying to kick out all the fat from their storage units to run on so if you're running on fat as your fuel source and you're actively losing weight no matter what people don't talk about this very often but whether they're on weight watchers whether they're exercising if you're losing weight your ldl cholesterol goes up why? Because it's coming out of storage where you don't see it. It's like letting things out of the storage unit. Then you see it, but you're not storing it. You're burning it as a fuel source. Who cares, right? It's the excess energy that becomes a problem. So yeah, in, in, in the ketogenic diet, some people will take in 10,000 calories of fat a day. 
that's not a good thing either. You want to have this balance. And so you're making sure you're getting enough protein, prioritizing protein, and then, you know, adding in fat for satiety. So if you're having, you know, olive oil and one of the, I actually interviewed a, a doctor of Indian descent um, that works in, in the, in the Silicon Valley area in, in San Francisco. And, you know, I said, what do you do with people that are of Indian descent with diabetes out of control? And he said, well, we talked about eliminating the non bread and the rice. And, and I said, what do you do if they won't give up rice? He said, well, I try to do like cauliflower rice mixed with regular rice, make sure they're using ghee because their heart attack rates go way up when they're using vegetable oil because everyone mm -hmm. told them it was healthier. So when they just switched back to ghee, they did better. They had decreased strokes and heart attacks and all these things. So it, it does play a role. And then he said, funny enough, he said, if they won't stop the rice, um, I'll have them eat fried rice, right? Because the fried rice, believe it or not, has butter, it has fat source, has things, and it lowers the sugar levels compared to regular rice because there's less rice in fried rice because you have the carrots and the peas and whatever you're putting in there and meat maybe. Cool. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really a, it's really a, a, a challenge um, to get people to change their lifestyle, but there's such a fear. And then when you look at the data and, and there's, there's, uh, uh, you know, studies coming out with these lean mass hyper responders, and that's going to be really interesting to see what the results are. But routinely in my practice, I do a coronary calcium score, which will look at uh, cardiac disease. There's, mm -hmm. uh, there's coronary, um, angiograms that we can do if we're really concerned. And it's amazing how little disease people have with super elevated LDL cholesterols that are athletes that are, their insulin is normal. But, uh, for me, one of the biggest things was I, I was at a conference and, um, Ivor Cummins known as the fat emperor yes. was showing me data on this insulin. I thought, this is crazy. This slide that when I just discussed, I thought, this is crazy. There's no way. And he said, go back to your practice and check your insulin. So I started checking insulin. All of my patients who had cardiac disease, strokes, um, peripheral vascular disease, you know, blockages of their arteries, they all had high insulin all without exception. And I'm like, wow, we got to look at the insulin. So my first priority now is getting the insulin under control. And then we could worry about LDL if we need to, you know, I'm not anti statins or diet uh, other dietary changes, but I, I think the point is let's minimize the risk for that patient. And if it's high and we don't have a good answer, we need to look at that. But it's surprising, especially in people who are morbidly obese with their, their visceral fat, as you were saying, are full. Uh, mm -hmm. When we lower that, their LDL cholesterol gets better when mm -hmm. we lower the, the visceral fat. So visceral fat, what happens if, it, if your storage units are so full, it starts leaking out sugar and fat and all these things into the bloodstream again. So when you start losing weight and, and emptying your storage unit, your body goes, oh, we can put some more stuff in the storage unit and, and, and put it there. So that's why, you know, people have a misconception it depends on what energy source you're burning. So if someone's on a strict ketogenic diet and they eat carbohydrates for the weekend on Monday, their, their LDL cholesterol will drop by 80 or 90 points because right. now they're burning sugar as fuel source and puts the fat into the fat cells, if that makes sense. Yes. Yes. I think, yeah, Dave Feldman's uh, research has nicely shown that, right. The, that primary job is to carry that energy. So thanks for elaborating on that. Uh, and you also mentioned prioritizing protein, right? So that that's the other question that I wanted to uh, ask you that, you know, do you have patients who have, you know, that misconception or apprehension about eating protein because they have heard that, hey, you know, it might damage my kidneys, etc. Yeah, it comes up all the time, you know, and you look at it. So, you know, all I can say is, okay, let's look at Sean Baker. Like he probably eats more protein than anyone that I know. His kidneys are working fine. His labs are normal. So, you know, uh, it's been addressed by, by Jason Fung, who's a kidney doctor. It says, look, eating more protein doesn't damage the kidneys. And then you have all these uh, muscle guys, the weightlifter guys who get huge muscles. Uh, you're eating a ton of protein to maintain that. Most of us can't even eat that much protein to, to be that, you know, I mean, that's the biggest issue is trying to get enough protein in. And that's the other side of the coin is some people are trying to like force protein all day and all night, just eat as much. But if you're eating a healthy diet, you're going to get enough protein. You may have to, you know, add a little bit of meat here and there or some eggs or egg whites if you want. But uh, there's ways around it. I have patients who are vegetarian that we work with. Vegan is more challenging because if, if I can get someone to eat eggs, they can put muscle mass on. They can get a good protein source. It's hard to find a vegan source of protein that doesn't have a lot of carbohydrates along with it. So that's the challenge. I mean, we're trying to figure that out. I know Ben Bickman has been doing work with some pea proteins that purify and get the toxins out. And, and uh, hopefully he'll have a product soon that, that helps people with that. But, uh, you know, it, it, it's one of those things that I, I think most of us can't eat enough protein to cause any damage at all. You just can't 
eat it you it, you get so full that you can't eat a lot and that's the other thing with calories where we get uh, uh confused is for instance a uh, Lay's potato chips, you know, a, a, a big bag, a family size bag is about, I think it's around 2,600 calories. In order to get that much in meat, you'd have to eat six or eight ribeye steaks, eight ounce ribeye steaks. Like no one could eat that and then go out to dinner afterwards. But you could eat chips all day watching a, a soccer game or something. And then all of a sudden you, you want to go out to dinner afterwards. So it's not all just about calories. It's about satiety, getting full of what you're, with what you're eating. So for me personally, I don't add extra protein to my patients. Like say, you know, eat, eat, eat whey protein or, you know, protein shakes and powders. I do use health code um, and keto chow for people who really like shakes and they, they don't have time to make things. So having a good protein source with, with good fats uh, involved is definitely helpful. And in my seniors, I do that because the, there's a high caloric intake. So, but they're also getting avocado oil and coconut oil and they're getting, you know, a ghee and they're getting healthy stuff like apple cider vinegar with that. So I feel good about that. Uh, instead of the, the commercial products that you see for seniors, it's just all the seed oils and terrible stuff and, and they get metabolically sicker and then they're mental, they mentally decline. So it's amazing when people get their nutrition, right? What happens to the mitochondria and, and their energy level and their focus and their memories getting better. It's, it's a miracle to see. True, true. Sometimes we accept some of these as just uh, a function of age, right? I mean, people sort of say to each other, hey, you know, I'm 60 or whatever, and, you know, or sometimes even 50 these days. And people sort of accept that level of ill health, which they really shouldn't. Uh, but it's great that, you know, because of you and several doctors like you, we are seeing the light. And I think they should <laughs> learn from that. Uh, another question I had was, do you see patients who are suffering from gout or, you know, higher uric acid, etc.? Um, yeah, yeah, honestly, to... I, yeah, yeah, honestly, I haven't seen that, but I've talked to experts with uh, with regard to gout, and it's very interesting the physiology. Uh, uh, one of the biggest risk factors that people don't talk about is high fructose corn syrup, right? That's a huge risk factor. So, what happens is the uric acid, which builds up with gout, if you change the level of uric acid quickly or um, there's a drastic change very quickly, you can get a gout attack. So if I put people on, so for instance, if you keep having gout attacks, and I say, okay, I'm gonna put you on something to lower your, your uric acid. When I do that, I start really slow, like every third day and then go up to every, because if you change that level too quick, boom, you get a gout attack and then you're in pain and you have to take you know, steroids and anti-inflammatories to fix that problem. So in the early stages of a ketogenic diet or a, a carnivore diet, the, the ketones compete with the uric acid for excretion. So your uric acid can transiently go up, but over time it goes way down below where it was before. So I don't see people with chronic gout problems that are on a ketogenic diet. Personally, I've never seen it. I've never seen it. So, you know, theoretically, you know, and it can happen, for instance, someone with high uric acid and they eat a bunch of shellfish like uh, shrimp, if they eat an all shrimp diet. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or beer, you know, things like that. We'll see it come out. But, uh, you know, uh, most people, when they start eating a low carb, their sugars and their fructose goes down so quickly that um, we can maintain them without getting an attack of gout. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, you sort of made a mention of, you know, genetics uh, a few minutes back. So I want to wanted to get your take on that. So I, I sort of hear two almost extreme things, right? One is that, hey, you know, my earlier generations had these metabolic disorders. So I think I'm destined for that. That's one or the other is, you know, uh, they didn't have it. So I'm, you know, I'm safe. And I, I sort of, it doesn't ring true, but I, I wanted your elaboration on that. Yeah. I think th there's something called epigenetics, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're stressed all the time and tense and don't sleep, you're more likely to get diabetes. As an example, uh, in, in the U S the Navy SEALs, they, there was a study I read about, um, uh, when they were sleep if they put them on sleep deprivation for four days, they started getting insulin resistant and these are the fittest of the fit. So, yeah. you know, if you're, if you're living a poor lifestyle and you're smoking and drinking, like you, you, you don't help your odds of not getting it. So if you have a gen genetic predisposition, for instance, if someone has a genetic predisposition to getting cancer and they smoke and drink all day, well, their risk goes way up of getting that cancer. So if you have a genetic predisposition to cancer, but you le live a clean, healthy lifestyle and you stay away from the drugs and you get enough sleep and you watch your rest and things like that, then people can uh, prevent it. So in my family, that's what I was looking at with all my uncles dying at a young age of diabetes complications. I thought, wow, if I do what they're doing, I'm going to end up the same way they're ending up. Because what they would do is say, well, 
And this is the problem with Western medicine is their doctors. And I saw it and I, I, I witnessed this before I even went to medical school. I said, this doesn't make sense. But my aunt would say, oh, her sugars are out of control. And she's, you know, she checked her sugars 300. Oh, I'm just going to have to shoot a bunch more insulin. But I guess to have my cake because the insulin will make my sugars go down. Well, it's making your sugars go down by shoving all that into your fat tissue, into your brain, into your heart, into your feet, into your. So then you start having all these complications of overload of sugar, right? It's a big problem. That's what the diet, that's why if you want to look at your risk of heart attack and stroke, I would forget about the fat to start with and go, okay, if I'm diabetic, I got to fix that problem. That is the number one risk factor, no question about it, metabolic disease. And when we see it, there's no argument on that. You can't say that. But if you have high LDL cholesterol and you have diabetes, disastrous, right? It's really bad. But if you can bring your sugars down and bring your, your you know, and your LDL goes up as a result and your 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 uh, insulin, triglycerides, HL, every other marker is getting better. You have to look at the big picture. Mm-hmm. Right. So I think summarizing your point on the on the HDL, we, we want a high HDL, right? We want low triglycerides. So that should, and of course, good control over our insulin resistance. So we want to be insulin sensitive. And then, as you said, then worry about, uh, you know, others, uh, factors which are, which may be or may not be in our hands, like the genetics part of it. Uh, exactly. And I, and I think that's the important part is looking, okay, what's the most likely thing that's going to cause my patient to die? Let's fix that first. Like, you know, if you're, if you have termites all through your house, you don't repaint the outside of the house, you, you fix the termites <laughs> because your house is going to fall down if you don't fix that, you know, and that's what we have to look at the big picture rather than every doctor. They look at LDL, like do a little hole and that's what they're looking at. They don't look at the whole big picture and go, okay, what's the whole uh, process here? What we're dealing with, you know, and how do I make my patient healthier? Because I'm telling you, no one talks about stress and sleep and all these other things. And if you look at the data, people who have a better metabolic health and are enjoying life and laughing, I, I see people every day. And one of the biggest questions I ask that, that stumps people they can't answer, I'll say, hey, what do you do for fun? What do you enjoy doing? And they look at me like, I'm trying to survive. And I know in India, it's way harder because people have a hard, it's hard. People work hard. And so it's a... It's so hard to say, yeah, I don't sit and laugh or play with my kids or go, go look at the ocean because you feel bad because you have so much work to do. And that's how, that's why I decided to leave my practice where I was making a lot more money is because I realized you can't work 18 hour days and then take care of your wife and kids and family and have fun and go and do things, right? Because if you're always on this overdrive, it's not good for the body. No animal is stressed continuously. And interestingly enough, something I learned that I never really thought about is when animals are stressed, they won't eat. So if you have a dog and you take them to a new environment and they're not sure of the environment and you put their food down, they won't eat. They look around to make sure everything's safe and they guard everything because they don't want to be eating when there's something bad. And a deer is not running from the lion and says, okay, I'm going to stop and eat something. But when we're stressed and we're upset with our spouse or we're upset at work, we want to eat something because it makes us feel better temporarily, right? And so, and then in that same setting, our gut isn't ready to take that food because when it's stressed, it decreases blood flow to the gut. Then people have stomach pain. So some of the stuff you're talking about, all these things do feed on each other, you know? And so be able to relax, take a breath all the time as a, as a quick aside, just yesterday, I had two patients come in and they went on vacation and they ate more carbs than they normally do, but they lost weight. One of my guys lost, loses five or six pounds every time he goes on vacation because he could just relax and go to the beach and go for walks. And he's not stressed sitting there at his desk all day, worrying about, you know, making phone calls and doing things. So yeah, there is a, a lot to be said about the whole lifestyle, not just what we're eating. Yeah. So I have also seen sort of people really view it at a very superficial level, right? And in fact, they will make comments like, hey, you know, uh, I'm supposed to take my injectable insulin now. So I have to eat or, you know, I'm, you know, I, for that pill, you know, I have, I got to eat. So it almost sounds wrong because it's like, but how, how do you, you know, look at it or how do you, Explain to them that they are not really killing the fire. They are, you know, just waiting for the hose. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's so frustrating. It's so frustrating because no one, a little kid, if you talk to them, they get it because they haven't been brainwashed by the system yet. But for me, one of my partners at my old office was an endocrinologist. He treats diabetes. That's what he's trained to do. So when I started doing low carb and taking all my patients off insulin, he says, Brian, what you're doing is so dangerous. And I said, why is it dangerous? He said, because people get low sugars. Why would they get low sugars? Because if you give them insulin and they don't eat, their sugars will go low. I was like, okay, then you don't give them insulin. Well, if, if, if your patient who's on insulin, how do we dose? The, and I asked him, how do we dose the insulin? By how many carbohydrates you're eating. So how many carbohydrates are you eating for breakfast? We give you that much insulin to cover that meal. Then at lunch, how many carbohydrates? 
your snack. And so we're shooting insulin all day. And the more insulin you shoot, you get more insulin resistant. So then you need more and more to bring the sugars down. So I said, okay, if your patient wakes up in the morning and they're, they have, they're sick, they have the stomach flu, they can't eat breakfast, how much insulin do you give them? He said, well, you can't give them insulin if they're not eating. Okay. How about lunchtime? They still can't eat. How much insulin do you give them? Well, you don't give it to them if they're not eating. How about dinner and they can't eat because they're sick still? Well, you don't give them insulin. I said, okay. So instead of being sick, they're healthy when they wake up and they decide to have some eggs for breakfast. How much insulin do you give them? None. Why? Because they're not eating carbohydrates. So are you treating, like you're saying, are you treating the drug with the diet? <laughs> you're telling them to eat more carbohydrates so they don't get low sugar because you give them a drug to lower their sugars. It makes no sense at all. And that's what we do in the hospitals. They put people on, they're diabetic and they go in the hospital for surgery and they put them sugar in their veins. And they say, oh my gosh, their sugars are going high. Well, you're giving them sugar all day. <laughs> Stop giving them sugar, give them saline and you don't have to give them insulin. Then they give them insulin and sugar and it's a disaster. So you're, yeah, absolutely correct. It's, it's such a, a backwards thinking. It's like they're thinking about low sugars and we're thinking it's like, okay, if you don't eat the sugars. And even the other thing that's very interesting on this is a lot of people will say, well, when they eat their cereal for breakfast and their pancakes, they get low sugars before lunch. And they say, oh, I have to eat more sugar because I get low sugars if I don't eat sugar all the time. Well, if you stop eating sugar, then you don't get low sugars because the low sugar is coming from your body's insulin going. It's the same thing. If you eat a bunch of donuts for breakfast, your sugars go high and then insulin goes up and overcorrects and it goes low. And you go, oh, I need some chips. Then you eat chips and it goes up and down. So all day it's going up and down. But if that some same person eats eggs for breakfast with some vegetables, they're not hungry until after lunchtime. They go, oh, I don't need lunch. I'll just eat dinner when I get home because they're not starving all day. So hypoglycemia is an issue. And so people who have hypoglycemia frequently are more likely to get diabetes because they're making so much insulin, they get insulin resistant, then they, they get diabetes. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah. So they are, as you're describing, they are always on that you know roller coaster and uh, you are helping them come off of that, right? Instead of just you know correcting one with the other, so those two wrongs are not making a right, basically. Exactly right. Uh, yeah, exactly right. Uh, also, wanted to ask you, uh, you know, what are some of the key interesting research findings that you are observing in this, you know, overall low carb space that you are most excited about? That you are sort of looking forward to. Yeah, there's so much out there that I'm so excited about. The more that comes out every day, it's like, oh my goodness, this is confirmatory. This is confirmatory. This is confirmatory. So I'm really, what I'm really excited about, I think probably the most is the the mental health. You know, if we can prevent, mm -hmm. one of the scariest diagnoses that we can get is is uh, dementia. You know, mm -hmm. when you can't think anymore and, and you're a burden to your family. So, you know, these studies that they're doing with uh, on metabolic health with Chris Palmer, it's very important, you know, depression, anxiety, stress, all those things are huge, huge factors. And, and we think about the, the diabetes part of it, but I think when we step back and we start saying, okay, metabolic health, meaning getting the mitochondria, the, the power centers of the house, health, the, the cell healthier. And people say, ah, I feel my energy is coming up. I feel better. I don't feel like I have to eat all day. I'm able to go and do things and I'm laughing more. And when you see someone's life get better, that who wants to live longer if you're miserable and unhappy and you, you hate what you're eating and you feel tired all the time? You know, people want to have energy and they say, you know, I feel like going hiking. You know, if, I get it. Like my patient I was telling you about, when she was inflamed by eating so much sugar, her joints hurt. Like you think she's going to go exercise? But when you feel great, you go, I feel so good. I want to go walk. I want to go do something. I have energy. And now I can go do stuff. Uh, and, and it's a misconception that, you know, people are lazy and then they get obese. A lot of us have worked hard and exercised and done all the right stuff, but we ate terrible diet and we can't outrun a bad diet. You can't run enough to, you know, like my patient who got diabetes when he was 150 something pounds, because he was eating so much sugar, his body just said, I can't, I can't take it. I can't keep up anymore and stop making insulin. So once he rested it again, then he can start making insulin and, and getting healthy. So it's a big it's a big picture, but I think those are the most exciting studies I'm seeing. And then, you know, the decreasing of, of cardiovascular disease. I'm, I'm really uh, uh, intrigued by what Dave Feldman's doing. And once we have data to say, yes, look, these people are having hugely high cholesterol and they're not dying of heart attacks. We feel a lot better about our position. But until then, we have to say, we don't know. I don't know. If, if I see someone with the LDL cholesterol of a thousand, I, it worries me. And I want to intervene on that. And sometimes it's adding more carbohydrates into the diet if they're very thin and they do better and exercising a little less. Sometimes if people are exercising four hours a day, sometimes their sugars are crazy high. So we decrease their exercise, increase their carbohydrates and they get better. 
because their body's not so stressed anymore trying to look for energy. So it's really just individualizing it for each person. And, and I think the more and more research that's coming out, we're seeing study after study that's showing that that people are doing better from a diabetes standpoint. And you know, all we can do is say, uh, okay, like you know, I, I heard uh, Dr. Barry talking about the the study from Harvard saying that meat causes diabetes, and mm -hmm. if you if you look at the data and you look at your continuous glucose monitor, that's, it, it, you realize that's a, a crazy statement. I, Cause I could always make an argument if, for instance, if I'm super low carb and keto and I go for a huge run and I work out really hard and I ride my bike up hills, my sugar goes higher than anything with that mm -hmm. because my body says, Oh, you need sugar. I'm going to make some sugar and kick it out to you. I'm not getting low sugars when I'm exercising. I get high sugars. So you could look at that and say, well, exercise is dangerous because the sugars go up. Well, no, that's how the body reacts to, strenuous exercise or stress. I see people who are stressed all the time, their sugars go up when they're calm, their sugars come down, getting a massage or doing something you enjoy. So I think the more data we have and the more clinical experience, that's what I'm excited about is, is things like what Dr. Unwin is doing over in the UK and seeing people lowering their sugars and insulin and their quality of life gets better. And they're laughing again. I think there's, we went into medicine to help people not to manage symptoms for the rest of your life and, you know, do amputations and put you on dialysis and try to keep you alive. And you're miserable the whole time. We want people to have a quality of life. And, and like you said, so many people just say, well, you're getting old. So yeah, that, that's what you expect. And then you see, you know, people in their nineties who are out hiking and working out. I had a guy, we were riding our bike and a guy, he had to be 90 and he's run, ran past us on a, you know, just running. I think, wow, this guy, you know, he's, he's not sitting around watching TV all day and saying, okay, I'm old. You know, you just, you keep fighting and, and, and doing what you can to make yourself a little bit healthier. True. So true. So, uh, that's quite inspiring to know. So, from your, uh, you know, all the examples that you gave, uh, one question that arises is, can something be done to include more of this, you know, uh, when our doctors are being trained, you know, in their syllabus or uh, while they're in medical college, what's your take on that? It's a hard thing. I think over the last couple of years, I've realized that medicine has been hijacked. You know, when you have you know, it's a hard thing. Like the American Diabetes Association, if you look at their funding, it's on this side is pharma, on this side is big food, right? So pharma says, eat all the food you want, eat chips and crackers and all that, and we can shoot you with drugs and give you, and we can we can help you. And the food says, well, you can eat all of our stuff and then you can just take the drug and then you'll be okay. It's like, well, the stuff doesn't disappear when you're eating terrible foods all the time. So there's a conflict of interest and it's hard because if all of a sudden the ADA comes out, the American Diabetes Association, which everyone in the world is basing their recommendations on and says, uh, you shouldn't eat cereal. Then the cereal comes and says, okay, we're not sponsoring you anymore. Then they go bankrupt, right? So it's hard because once you get this conflict of interest, it's hard to get out of that. So what do you do if you're in charge of this, this corporation? Because the reality is we're advocates for our patients. And unfortunately, once you're taking money from other sources, then uh, you're no longer objective and you, you lose your perspective. So I think that's what's happened with a lot of organizations now they're kind of hostage and they can't really say anything says if i'm sponsoring your 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 if i'm paying for this meeting and you start saying bad things about me i'm like you know what i'm not paying for this anymore <laughs> you know so then you guys so that's what i mean there's there's a huge conflict and so that's why you know when you look at nutritional education a lot of the big foods like uh, you know coca-cola does most of the the funding for sports medicine uh, research and they say well just exercise more and you could drink coke all the time you know? so mm -hmm. it's a conflict of interest and it's a problem and, and i think that's something that you know some of the good doctors are really looking at saying how do we how do we fix this problem where there's not a because the reality is when you're doing a lo low carb or ketogenic diet there's really no money to do a ton of research on that because you know none of us want to fork out all of our money to do a study when clinically we're seeing the benefits. So all I can say is like, here's 50 of my patients. You could talk to them and tell, let them tell you what their life is like. Right. And so that's why we did low carb MD to get more doctors. And what you're doing is getting more doctors. Yeah, this is what I'm doing. And here's what my results are. You can look at my charts. You can see the data that speaks for itself. And that's ultimately what professor Noakes and, and Gary Fetke did is they said, look at our charts, look at our data, look what we're saying. And they said, okay, you guys, <laughs> but they went through three years of torture to get there, you know, but, they, 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 they had the courage not to back down and say, okay, because they gave them both the option. You could just walk away and not saying anything and we'll just let these charges drop. And then they said, no, we'll fight you because they mm -hmm. knew. And if they don't fight, we're not talking right now. Yeah. Right. 
because we're not going to take the, I can't, I'm not going to go through three years of trial and deal with all that stuff. But they had the courage to stand up and say, look, the system's wrong. And so until doctors stand up and say, Hey, look, the system's wrong. When I put people in, cause I saw it too. You put people on a high carbohydrate diet and their sugars go higher and you go, well, this doesn't make sense. Put them on eggs and they get better, <laughs> right? Give them a steak and they do better or fish and they do better. So, you know, I, I think we, we're all going to evolve over time and we're going to say, oh, eating too much fat might be a problem. Let's eat more protein. Eat more protein is a problem. Let's get this balance right. So ultimately, it's an individual thing because the end of one experiment, like for instance, for you, what works for you? It doesn't matter what works, works for Sean Baker. We're not Sean Baker. So when you talk about the genetic component, like you can't, you know, I heard someone just recently say this and I kind of liked it. You can't take a basset hound, which is a big, thick dog, put them on the treadmill, then it becomes a greyhound, which is really super skinny. But they could be the healthiest basset hound they can be. So some of us are never going to have six-pack abs and have muscles like Sean Baker, but we can be as healthy as we can be, and we can go for hikes with our grandkids, you know, and, and enjoy our quality of life. It's it's not all about looks; it's about metabolic health, right? To some, it, it, to ultimately. Uh, so you know, it's just figuring out where you want to be and 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 what quality of life you want to have. You know, most people don't want to be in the gym for fourteen hours a day; they want to go live their life and go have fun, right? True. Yeah. Perfect. No, I think this is so inspiring listening to you. Uh, I'm sure both for, uh, you know, uh, all the, all our viewers as well as, you know, your peers and colleagues. Uh, so I, let me invite Shashi uh, to come back uh, just to say a few words. Dr. Brian, thank you for accepting this invite and appearing in the pioneering event of India. Metabolic Health Conference and the first Look Up Conference. Thank you. Really indebted to you and so happy to have you in this platform. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you both. Thank you so much. And and it's amazing what you pulled together. I mean, you did such a great job. So I'm really, I'm really happy for you. Um, and you know, I saw the next speaker and man, every speaker you've had is just amazing. So it's, it's so great to get the word out and I appreciate you. Like we all do our part in our part of the, uh, of the world and say, okay, I'm going to try to educate doctors and you're going to try to educate the, the masses. And I think we all work together and, and, and it's amazing what we can accomplish. And when people hear the stories and see it and see their family members doing better, that's, that's, what's going to win people over the results that we see, you know? And so it's fun, you know, my, for my, just as you, for my, my uh, practice, I've never advertised. I'm like, you know what, if I can't do it on word of mouth, then I don't belong in medicine. If I can't get enough patients to say, Hey, look, I'm doing great. I'm happy. I'm feeling good. Then, you know, I shouldn't have to advertise on the news every day to try to get patients because word of mouth. And so what you're doing is so important because, you know, uh, when you reach one or two people, they reach uh, 50 people. So, you know, thank you for what you're doing and, and for, it's hard to put all these doctors together and get the timing right. So it's amazing what you pulled off. So, so my hat is off to you both. So it is, it's a joint effort between me and Anup Singh of D-Life. So he's my guru and this is a, this is a joint venture that we have done it together. And plus, of course, uh, the entire team is with me. I mean, this is not a one man or two man show, this Mandar and then a lot of others on the back end who are all working together to make it happen. And in this program, we wanted to invite only doctors and local organizations because Indian public will believe doctors only. So we wanted doctors from different nations to come and tell that local is safe. And the organizations, what work they are doing in the local front. So highly obliged. Thank you very much, Dr. Brian. Thank you. All right. Thank you all.